It's go time. Welcome everyone to Third Down Gamble. The playoffs are underway in the Canadian Football League and some great stories already out of the semifinals in each conference as the uh, Stampeders and Lions for the first time ever met in British Columbia to play a semifinal game. The Alouettes prevail over the Tiger Cats in Montreal, something they hadn't done in quite some time. First things first, overall impressions, both had very good attendance, games were interesting they were it was some exciting playoff football the scores were a little bit more of a point spread than i was anticipating i thought we were going to see some closer games than they were but sometimes you get behind a little bit and you have to get out of your comfort zone and try to do too much and i think that was the case a little bit for uh, for a couple of these teams really well contested games some surprising strategy came into play and we saw that kind of come back to haunt the Calgary Stampeders a little bit the Stampeders who use the name of our podcast as a methodology the third down gamble to try to gain advantage twice were stymied once in the second quarter and around I guess you'd want to call it with Malik Hendry he gets tripped up in the backfield, and the Stampeders turn the ball over on downs. The second one was after the Stampeders had run the clock down and called a timeout with about a second left, trying to draw the BC Lions offside. They then decide to go after the first down. They're at the 18-yard line, and with the Goal line close to them, you would think that you would do a straight-up play on the first time that you had the ball as opposed to the second. But the second time, some miscommunication between quarterback Jake Mayer. Was it Malik Henry? Was it Reggie Bagleton? Hard to tell who the intended target was, but the ball floats, bounces off the ground, and the Lions get the football. Ironically, they move the ball down the field. It's a third-down gamble for them, upon which they get a scoring play. The attempt to draw the other team offside on those third and shorts, statistically, I don't think it generally works very often. I have seen occasions where it does, but in a situation like that where you've got some momentum, you're driving the ball down the field, I think it's in your best interest to get a play off quickly and not give that defense time to get set up. By by stopping the clock, taking the time out with one second left, it's clear BC's defense isn't going to bite and now you've got to run a play and and I believe it was a little bit of overthought maybe on Dave Dickinson's part to try to strategize and try to draw BC offside. It rarely works unless you've got an overanxious defense and they're maybe not expecting you to not snap the ball but BC seemed to be ready. It was a situation where the Stampeders were third and two, not third and one. So the the element of peril for the defense wasn't as strong. The bigger part of the equation was BC sent basically a blitz after Mayer. He's backpedaling. Bagleton looks like he's going to make a move to the out, stops, takes two steps, stops. Malik Henry has basically parked it because the two are sitting one on top of the other and Mayer throws it to a spot where he hopes that one of the two will actually go to get it, and neither one does. It's just miscommunication, but it hurt the Stampeders. At that time, the Stampeders are within reach of the Lions. If they kick the field goal, they're only down by four. Exactly. One thing that comes into play in playoff games is you see a little bit more trickery and a little bit more chance-taking, and that was what Calgary was doing. We saw in a game earlier with playoff implications on the line where the Montreal Alouettes and Danny Machocha were going for it on third downs to try to get that win in order to host a, the Eastern final. When the games are this important, that's when you pull out all the stops. Unfortunately for Coach Dickinson and the Stampeders, it didn't go their way, but you have to give them some credit for 
taking the chances and really trying to turn that game around. In the situation that we saw with the Stampeders, had they, especially on the BC third down gamble, the, the play was red, but Pipkin was able to get the ball away just prior to, and suddenly you've got two open receivers down the field. Asher's the one who catches the ball and scores, and that really seemed to turn the game completely in BC's favor. You could call that a points off turnovers, which is fair because the Stampeders had turned it off and f- over. In fact, the only two turnovers for the Stampeders the entire night were on those third down gambles. Ironically, or maybe prophetically, Milt Stiegel had said in the pregame show, sometimes in playoffs, coaches get too involved and maybe overthink things. And you could argue in this case that Dickinson, in either case, did that. If we go back to the 2016 Grey Cup, Andrew Buckley comes in. They normally do a dive play or do a handoff with Jerome Messam for a short third and for the Stampeders in that year. But they decide to kick Buckley to the side. He gets tackled. I believe it might have been Abdul Kenna that might have done it. I'm not sure for the Red Blacks. Anyway, he is tackled and the Stampeders turn the ball over. It was something that they uncharacteristically had tried. The same thing happened in this football game, Malik Henry. they All season, Tommy Stevens had gone straight over the middle. Now, all of a sudden, you, you try and trickery by kicking a receiver coming around the formation off to the edge and trying to get him to get the angle to get upfield. Well, that never happened. And the Stampeders lost the ball on downs when Henry was tackled in the backfield. You take field position into account in these situations as well. They were well into BC Lions territory. So the high risk call was a bit unnecessary. One thing that Tommy Stevens brings to the table when he walks onto that field is size and length. He's a a very tall quarterback. So to ask him to essentially fall forward for the yard is not asking a lot. And by taking the ball out of his hands for an end around play, puts you at risk if you've got a, a linebacker or a defensive back that is is playing that spy position and not letting anybody get to the outside, which BC played well. They protected that outside and, and the end result was a loss and an unsuccessful third down gamble. If Javian Elliott gets to Pipkin, the Lions will be in the same boat. But Pipkin backpedals quickly enough that he gets the ball away and with some accuracy, unlike Mayer, who really had, with the anticipation, had missed what was going on with the receivers. Again, it takes two to tango. We often say football is a game of inches or millimeters, and there are two cases where if Elliot gets to Pipkin, Antonio Pipkin doesn't get that ball away, how does that turn the game around? And and that he missed him by what half a second maybe it was very quick it was a a very tenacious defensive line by the Calgary Stampeders getting after it the biggest difference in those two throws was the amount of air under the ball as well mayor tried to throw it to a spot in pipkin's situation the receivers were so far beyond any defensive player that he just needed to get air under the ball it was a very accurate throw I will give him credit for that but I don't even think it really needed to be if he got the ball up in the air one of those receivers could get it at least for the first down in this situation it was a beautifully thrown ball and a very easy trot into the end zone with BC getting that they broke the game open as I indicated earlier and the Stampeders were scrambling now let's get to part two of that equation in the fourth quarter we see Bo Levy Mitchell come into the game to try to resurrect the team and get them into a situation where they maybe have a chance in the final minute. He comes close. Mitchell leads the team in that fourth quarter, and they do get some results with him, enough to merit an onside kick at the end of the game to try to see if they can do something to get within one more score. They did, and 
we'll get into the game details here a little bit in second down as well. But Bo Levi Mitchell came in and in less than a quarter puts up more passing yards than Jake Mayer does for the first three quarters of the game. It's maybe a situation of too little too late. Mayer was not putting up big numbers and moving the ball down the field. They had only mustered a couple of field goals prior to that. It was some reluctance by Dave Dickinson to go to a proven quarterback like Levi Mitchell. He maybe should have gone that way a little bit sooner than he did. There will be a debate about that from here until eternity. Had they maybe made the switch at halftime, what would that have meant for the Calgary Stampeders? It's interesting because they hadn't done it all season. The only time that they had switched out the starting quarterback for the backup was in Toronto. And that was at halftime when Jake Mayer came in for Bo Levi Mitchell. And that was basically the end of the tour for Mitchell on the field until he got a few snaps at the end of the last game of the last home game, I should say, in Calgary at the end of the season. And then obviously these few minutes with the game on the line against the BC Lions. Now he has in the past rallied Calgary with massive fourth quarters. He's done it against Edmonton in the playoffs. He's just that type of guy that doesn't back down from any situation. It does now beg of the question, if we look at the two players and try to make a determination as to where Calgary needs to go from here, it looks as, for all intents and purposes, that Jake Mayer is going to be the quarterback that will start as their quarterback in Calgary. But if you look at the season that was, both he and Bo Levi Mitchell have gone 6-3 and three in the regular season. And they have comparable stats overall for the season. And it just makes you wonder, is it a rush to judgment maybe by the Stampeders? We know that the shoulder was aggravating the play of Mitchell. He, he was not the same character. But when he stepped on that field against BC, he was throwing dimes everywhere. He didn't miss anybody. I'm really looking forward to what happens with Bo Levi Mitchell next year. One thing that this game did was prove that he's got something left in the tank. And recently, where have we seen a quarterback with some injury troubles step into another team and have some success? Look no further than the two-time defending champion Winnipeg Blue Bombers and Zach Kolaris. He was basically shipped off from Saskatchewan where he had some success as a starting quarterback. Toronto didn't get him into the lineup because of injury. He ends up going to Winnipeg and proves that when healthy, he is one of the top, if not the top quarterback in the league. Bo Levi Mitchell, we know he's got MVPs. He's got Grey Cup championships. He's 32 years old, but that shoulder looked pretty good in that fourth quarter. And at 32, he's not over the hill by any stretch. This is, for a lot of quarterbacks, the prime of their career. The experience is there. The game has slowed down. He is now probably at the zenith of where he'll be for the next few seasons. That does make him a very interesting free agent. TSN has tried to sign him with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, and it's for fun, so has Three Down Nation. Whether or not that will ever come to fruition, given the history between Mitchell and the Rough Riders, especially when Chris Jones was here, one wonders if that would be a marriage that uh, would ever come to fruition. I think it would be very tough for Stampeders fans to see Bo Levi Mitchell suddenly in Rough Rider green and white. Stranger things have happened, but I have to believe not only are the Rough Riders interested, but pretty much every team in the East potentially is looking for a change at quarterback as well. We don't know the health of Jeremiah Mazzoli in Ottawa. There are certainly some questions in Hamilton with what they are going to be doing. Trevor Harris is a bit older than Bo Levi Mitchell, so perhaps on that end of his career, we'll see what happens with the Toronto Argonauts. McLeod Bethel-Thompson has proven to be a a quality starting quarterback this year, leading the league in yardage, but we'll have to see contracts come into play, who's a free agent. There will be some competition to see who lands Bo Levi Mitchell. It will bring about some bidding I'm just curious. I don't know in the East other than Toronto, and that really is incumbent upon what McLeod Bethel-Thompson does in the East final. And if he wins it, 
if he does well in the Grey Cup, how do you unseat him as your starting quarterback? Now, Ryan Dinwiddie, of course, had coached Bo Levi Mitchell in Calgary. The Stampeders are trying to paint Toronto red and white with all of the players that have moved from Calgary to Toronto. Second down. Semi-final weekend in the CFL. The first game on the docket was the Montreal Alouettes hosting the Hamilton Tiger Cats in Percival Molson Stadium. The Alouettes start strong. Hamilton never in any moment gains the lead. And the Alouettes then hang on for a 28-17 to victory. As we sort of suspected, Hamilton did go with two quarterbacks. They were looking for a spark from Matthew Schiltz, maybe to provide something that Dane Evans had not provided them. Schiltz, on the drive that he starts in the game in the third quarter, takes the team down the field, scores a touchdown, but that's it. They get a field goal after that, and really, the Alouettes' defense seemed to be the difference. Trevor Harris, though, played himself a great game. He did, a very solid night. 27 for 34, 243 yards, one touchdown, one interception. We got the good Trevor Harris for this playoff game. The Hamilton Tiger Cats' late season push in in winning five of their last six games really saw a turnaround in their running game. Suddenly, when you get behind in a playoff game, you, you start to shy away from that. And the result was 37 rushing yards combined between West. Hills, Sean Thomas Erlington, and Tim White on one rushing play. So uh, kind of an abysmal rush game after they had been so successful running the ball in the last couple of months. You almost wondered if Montreal had a focus that they were not going to let Hamilton beat them with their running game. And as such, then force the quarterbacks to make plays. Montreal's defense picked up six sacks against the Tiger Cats. Tiger Cats got three against the Alouettes. And you look at the other side of the ball, rushing the ball for the Montreal Alouettes. Walter Fletcher, seven carries for 77 yards. Fantastic game for him, including a touchdown. William Stanback coming back from injury, 10 carries, 66 yards. So you look at a 6.6 yard average per carry is not even close to the number that Walter Fletcher put up. So uh, a really good job, not only by Trevor Harris throwing the ball, but that running attack by Montreal played a huge factor as well. The Alouettes, the only time that they really seemed to be out of sync was in that third quarter where they didn't pick up a first down. But they were keeping the tie cats away from their end zone with their defense. And sometimes it's it's kind of uh, one side of the ball will do well, then the other side will do well. And you saw that with the Alouettes, that they could rely on both sides of the ball to do something for them. And then, of course, Chandler Worthy, at, right at the start of the game, takes the opening kickoff across midfield and sets up Montreal on a short porch to score their first touchdown on the opening drive. It was a real well-balanced game by the Montreal Alouettes, and I think they are poised to give the Toronto Argonauts fits coming up in this Eastern final if they continue to play the way they have. A couple of the receivers had some phenomenal numbers as well. Eugene Lewis, as expected, uh, seven catches for 98 yards. Jake Wenicke has made a little bit of a resurgence here late in the season. Five catches, 60 yards, and a touchdown as well. So to get him back in the offense bodes well for the Alouettes. Moving out to the liquid sunshine coast, British Columbia, the Lions host a playoff game against the Calgary Stampeders. The first time in history that those two teams have had a game where the Stampeders were the road team versus BC in the playoffs in the semifinal. The Lions with Nathan Rourke hobbling to play He comes out and he performs very well in his very first playoff game. Over 30,000 people at BC Place watch Rourke go 22 of 30 for 321 yards, two touchdowns, and he leads the Lions to the victory, 30 to 16 over the Calgary Stampeders. A bit of a stunner because if you looked at the odds making prior to the game, it was almost a dead heat. It was Nathan Rourke does not look 100% healthy. He 
did enough good things in this one to get the win. He threw for 321 yards and two touchdowns, so you can't take anything away. But he was clearly hobbling and favoring that foot towards the end of the game. And if he's not fully rested and ready, that Winnipeg defense could give him a long day in the cold investors' group field coming up this coming Sunday. For the Calgary Stampeders, Jake Mayer gets the start, goes into the deep end of the game, actually. 12 of 22 for 138 yards, probably the worst outing that he's had all season. A lot of commentary about giving him a pass because it's his first playoff game and he's on the road. But what about Nathan Rourke, who was also in his first playoff game and all the pressure of being at home? Rourke clearly outperformed Mayer. He did. As we talked about earlier, Bo Levi Mitchell came in 8 for 11 for 147 yards. So nine more passing yards than Jake Mayer got through three quarters in the game. That last drive by Bo Levi Mitchell, however, was a little bit of a anomaly in the yards. I believe BC was playing in prevent mode and just trying not to get beat deep. So Mitchell did string together several completions but he was also just kind of taking what the defense was giving him. 147 yards is a, a great fourth quarter, but the, the game situation led to a bit of an increase in those passing yards. Stan Peters, who had led the league in rushing going into this game, Kadeem Carey only gets 43 yards on eight carries. Dedrick Mills, another 16 on two. Meanwhile, James Butler again, has a big day at the office despite getting a little bit of a nick in the game. He goes 20 carries for 95 yards. All told, the uh, Lions are over 110 yards in rushing. They were. I thought Calgary's defensive line played well throughout this game. They did get to Nathan Rourke four times for quarterback sacks and, and did continue to put some pressure on. However, there was something missing in that Calgary defense. It just wasn't quite up to the standard that we're used to seeing from the Stampeders, and that was a big difference in this game as well. Rourke in BC places made a lot of defenses look very ordinary. I think I can give a pass to the Stampeders defense. Even though BC had over 470 yards of total offense, 30 points is no shame, and when one of those plays is a massive third down gamble that uh, when Hatcher catches that football, I think as much as anything, the Stampeders were aghast at what was going on as the crowd. We talked about Montreal firing on all cylinders in their game. And I think that was the same case for the BC Lions in this one. The special teams, Sean White, Sean White was three for three on his field goals. So that came into play a little bit as well. Nothing super flashy on the return game necessarily, from Terry Williams, but positive yards every time that he touched the ball. But it was really the, I think, the the punting of Stefan Flintoff and the kicking of Sean White that was the difference on special teams here as well. And that raises the question. We know Rene Paredes has talked a little bit about retirement. Is this the end of the road for him? He did go three for three in this one, redeeming himself from what happened last year in the playoffs in Saskatchewan. He is is leaning towards possibly the end of his career. If you think back to that semifinal in Regina, he was missing by a width of a football at most, right? It's where he barely missed. Sometimes in a stadium, the wind will swirl in odd directions and a kick that you think you've hit well will suddenly start to drift. One impressive note was that crowd in BC, over 30,000 for the playoff game. It was fantastic to Fantastic to see that kind of energy from the BC Lions fans. We know attendance has been talked about a lot. The fact that they opened the upper bowl and drew that many more fans was a big plus. You look at Calgary overall this season, they were a combined one and six against BC and Winnipeg. So the the two teams that are still standing in the West were the Achilles heel for the Calgary Stampeders. And it was proven once again with this semifinal game. That's interesting you use the term Achilles heel because if you're losing to the teams that bested you not only on the field that day but bested you in the standings overall, it shows you where you are in the order of things. And the Stampeders clearly were number three in the West. They were the, there's arguments to be made that they're the third best team overall in the CFL. And 
it, it shows how tough and how competitive this West division is to see a team with a, a 12 win regular season going on the road in the first round of the playoffs. And then again, failing to beat those two teams that finished above them in the standings. The 12 win season for the Stampeders, a big disappointment that they don't go anywhere with it. There will be changes in Calgary. We've mused about what may happen in their quarterbacking situation. I'm just curious, would they ever rethink it and say, we'd rather stick with what we know than maybe Mayor is what we don't know? But it's hard to say the dollar value is a huge factor in the salary cap world. It is. It'll be interesting to see what John Huffnagel and that crew decide to do. Speaking of, of John, he says he's not going anywhere. He's sticking around for at least a couple more years in that GM role for the Calgary Stampeders. We talked a bit last off season about Andrew Harris and Winnipeg's decision not to re-sign him. And there's the question of, do you want to be a year too early or a year too late in saying goodbye to somebody with Andrew Harris's injuries? It looks like Winnipeg made the, the timely decision with what Bo Levi Mitchell showed in this fourth quarter of this playoff game. It's really hard to say he could sign somewhere else and bring back some magic and, and lead a team to a gray cup or two before it's all said and done. And if Calgary doesn't win with Jake Mayer in that same time frame, you start to question that decision. You think back to the Edmonton situation with Ricky Ray and they trade him away. He goes to Toronto and he wins two more gray cups with the Argonauts. Third down. Two games in the CFL as we go to the conference finals. First off, we have the Montreal Alouettes in Toronto to take on the Argonauts. Now, despite the fact that these teams have met multiple times in the playoffs, this will only be the third time they've met in Toronto for the East Final. You'd think with only nine teams in the league, these combinations would be a lot more prominent. But there's, there's some really interesting stats, as we discussed earlier the first time that Calgary played in BC in a semifinal game as well. So some fascinating stuff. The last time Winnipeg and BC played in a Western final, 1985. So some big gaps in there. I know Winnipeg did move back and forth between East and West during some of those stretches as well. But with the long history of the CFL, very curious that some of these matchups have occurred so infrequently. The Argonauts are three and a half point favorites at this point in time over the Alouettes. The last two times that they have, and the only two times that they played in Toronto for an East final, the Argonauts won. Of course, Doug Flutie was at the helm of the Argonauts in that era, 96 and 97. Far different situation this time. The Argonauts, lots of pressure on their starting quarterback, McLeod Bethel Thompson. He did get the extra rest, didn't play in the team's final regular season game. So he's basically been off for three weeks. The defense for Toronto, Winton McManus, looks like he's going to be back to play. We don't give enough credit to that Toronto Argonaut defense. They have been stellar this year. The numbers may not provide for it in terms of total this or total that, but when it comes to stops and turnovers, they have done it in multitudes and that's the kind of factor that you want going into a playoff game. When I first looked at this matchup, I was starting to lean towards the Montreal Alouettes based on the way they played that game against the Hamilton Tiger Cats. But I'm with you. I started to think more about that Toronto Argonauts defense. Jagera Davis and Sean Oakman on that defensive line have been a great duo. And you've got Jamal Peters in that secondary a bit of a ball hawk as well. And I'm trending towards Toronto and that defense being the difference maker. McLeod Bethel Thompson having not played in about three weeks is a bit of a concern though. He is a notorious slow starter and this much of a layoff, it might be an even longer lag for him to get going at the start of this game. Trevor Harris is always the enigma that I'm curious about. He is the type of guy that if he gets hot, he gets blistering hot. And if he's cold, he's ice cold. There seems to be no in-between with him when it comes to playoff games. And I mentioned in the last podcast that if we see the Trevor Harris that lit up the Tiger Cats for five touchdowns in a playoff game, then nobody is going to be able to stop that team. He showed flashes of it against Hamilton this last weekend. He he was definitely 
accurate, but he wasn't getting chunk yards. He wasn't going down the field very much. Against the Argonauts, you're going to have to do that. I don't think you can move the ball on a 14-play drive and score a touchdown against Toronto. That just isn't going to happen. They're not going to let you do it. You've got to be able to get big yards. That's where Eugene Lewis is going to have to be big. Jake Wieneke is going to have to be big. They're they're going to have to go to their guys that make big plays, and they're going to have to get big gains, 30-plus, 40-plus yards. So even with that running attack that Montreal showed, you don't think it's going to be as much of a factor? No, not against Toronto. In fact, I would argue now, let's say that Andrew Harris is completely healed. He's back practicing with the team. He is definitely going to be an element in this football game. He does ratio change. It's just, does A.J. Ouellette get moved aside? I doubt it. I think you come with both. And granted, they're sort of the same style, except the one thing that Harris has always provided, he's a great blitz read protector. And the other thing that he does provide is coming out of the backfield on swing passes. He's fantastic at those, as we've seen in his years in BC and Winnipeg. If he's up to speed, and from what the discussion has been that I've been privy to, he has been a demon in his rehabilitation. He has just gone hard and heavy to try to bring himself back as fast as he could. Remember, this is a pectoral muscle, not his legs, so he will be a strong runner. The question in my mind is how much do the Argonauts want to trust him in this situation? If they feel confident that he can do some damage, watch out. Andrew Harris could have a big, big game. He could. I'm really excited to watch these Toronto running backs. A.J. Ouellette is a straightforward, bruising running back. He hits the hole hard. He's not afraid of contact when he gets into that backfield. Andrew Harris is also a power runner, but has a little bit more finesse than A.J. Ouellette at this point in in Ouellette's career. It could be a very solid and productive two running back attack for the Toronto Argonauts. And you're also going with the league leader in passing yards this season with McLeod Bethel Thompson. So we know Montreal's defense is capable, but they are going to have to bring their A game because I think there's a lot of weapons coming into play here for the Toronto Argonauts. You mentioned weapons for the Argonauts, and, and let's not forget the receiving core led by Curly Gittins Jr. You've got Mark Keith Ambles, you've got Juwan Breskison. They've got a lot of weapons that can catch the ball if Thompson is on target. We we kind of look at Thompson as this sort of this great big boulder that's sitting on top of a mountain, and once it gets going, nothing will stop it. But the question is, is there a fulcrum up there to get it going? This year is a, a big opportunity for McLeod Bethel Thompson. All he's done is put up decent numbers, but he doesn't seem to get the respect. And I'm as guilty as anybody of not giving McLeod Bethel Thompson the respect he probably deserves. If he gets it done in this final and and pushes the Argonauts through to the Grey Cup, it's going to be a big feather in his cap. And and certainly if he goes on and wins the Grey Cup, if Montreal comes in on the road and pulls the upset, do you start to question his capability to be the, the number one guy in in the uh, Argonauts organization. That is something that if he does lose this game, and let's say he looks poor doing it, that is something that the Argonauts are going to have to come to terms with. And if Bo Levi Mitchell is available and there's that connection with the head coach, who knows what could be coming in 2023 for Toronto. In the West, it's the BC Lions in Winnipeg to take on the Blue Bombers. The Blue Bombers five-point favorites going into this game. It'll be much chillier in Winnipeg than it was in the Dome in BC. The last time that these two teams met was 1985, as you indicated. They actually met in that 82 to 85 era four times in a row in the West Final. All games were played in BC plays. I'm really interested to watch this one as well, given what Winnipeg has shown in their ability to handle Nathan Rourke. They have been pretty solid against Nathan Rourke. And one thing that I had mentioned early on in the season when they were meeting was the height advantage of that Winnipeg Blue Bombers defensive line compared to Nathan Rourke. Jefferson and Jeffcoat are two very tall, lanky defensive linemen. Nathan Rourke is not a six foot five quarterback back there. So even if he does get some mobility and moves around a little bit, those Two defensive ends for Winnipeg are some of the best in the league at getting their hands up and knocking passes down. I think that's going to be a key for the Blue Bombers defense in in stopping that explosive Lions offense. The Lions, of course, 
an offensive juggernaut, 400 yards on average per game they gain. Most of that comes from the passing route, 300 yards per game. The Blue Bombers are the team that are right there all the time in term of in terms of individual stats, but it, it's their team play that has been the mark that they have established for the rest of the league to follow. Have never played the Lions in a Western Final in Winnipeg, so this will be a first. The Lions coming into this game, we saw what was happening with Nathan Rourke in his foot. He had to elevate it, and by about the fourth quarter, he was hobbling on the field. The one bonus, if you can consider it as such, it's going to be much colder in Winnipeg, probably below zero, and that will keep the swelling down in the foot. He's not going to really cause any more damage to that foot. The The surgery has worked. Uh, Lesfranc's injury is one that you can completely return from and be pain-free. Could have used maybe a couple more weeks, but when you're Living in a CFL world and the season's so short, you got to go when the opportunity avails. We saw the Calgary Stampeders get to him four times in that semifinal game. And if Winnipeg can bring equal kinds of pressure, Nathan Rourke better hope that that foot gives him a little bit of extra speed than he had against Calgary because he may be running for his life in this one. The Blue Bombers average two sacks per game. The Lions average about two and a half sacks per game. I don't know that it's going to be that that's going to be the the key factor. I think what you were talking about before, the wingspan of the ends of the Blue Bombers will definitely be as much a disruptor as anything. For sure. Winnipeg's sack numbers were down quite substantially from where they have been the last couple of seasons. But Willie Jefferson, once again, is a, a an all-star in this league. And what they do well is disrupt. They don't necessarily get all of the sacks, but they can make you scramble. They are very quick and they can get their arms up. We, we've seen both of those ends drop back into coverage as well. So if you're not watching exactly what they're doing, they can even get an interception or two. And that can be a difference maker as well. The last meaningful game, I guess, in terms of play for Zach Kolaris was October the 8th against the Edmonton Elks. He has played since, but very little. This is over a month, really, that he has played more than a quarter. Is he going to be rusty at all? Is that a risk? We've we've debated this in the past. We've seen that Mike O'Shea gives his veterans plenty of time off prior to the playoffs, and it hasn't hurt him in the past. Zach Claris only played one quarter in the last month, but what a quarter. All he did was lead two successful touchdown drives. So I'm not too worried about Zach Claris in this one. Greg Ellingson is still just kind of working his way back from injury. He did play in that last game of the season as well. I'm curious to see how much of a factor he is. And Drew Wolitarski, another receiver for Winnipeg as well. So they've got some some key guys starting to get back into the lineup Come playoff time, it's very rare that anybody is 100% healthy. But the amount of time that Greg Ellingson was out of the lineup, if, if he has rehabbed successfully, he could be a difference maker. For BC, it's going to be Butler and how well he can rush. If he can make some noise in the first quarter, that may set the Blue Bombers a little bit on their heels. You just look at that Blue Bomber defense and – there's experience and all-star leadership all over the place. It's going to be everything for the Lions offense to match that and find ways to defeat that. One key for the BC Lions on offense, though, is we saw Brian Burnham do some Brian Burnham things against the Calgary Stampeders in that last playoff game. So to have his sure hands and spectacular catches back in the lineup is going to be a big boost for BC. We don't know about Lucky Whitehead and, and where he is at. He was not able to play in the semifinal. If he's missing, it is a, a key cog in that offense, but we've seen Dominic Rhymes step up and have a real breakout season for the Lions as well. If there's one weakness for Winnipeg's defense, and we've talked about it in the past, is some of that secondary is a little bit untested, but you also do have Diedrich Nichols, Brandon Alexander, in that backfield as well. So there, there is some experience. It's up to BC to find the holes and go after them. The Blue Bombers are favored, justifiably so. They've won the last two Grey Cups. They are the 
team with the best record in the CFL at 15 and 3. You've got to keep yourself motivated and BC is not an easy out. I think the Lions can surprise them. There's a little bit more grit in BC and even though they're outside the dome and everyone thinks that a team outside the dome can't win in cold weather, but that is a bit of a myth. I am picking the Winnipeg Blue Bombers to win this game. And two of the big reasons are Zach Kolaris' record as a starting quarterback in Winnipeg is one of the best you've ever seen from a quarterback with one team in this league. Outstanding record, including a perfect playoff record. And Coach Mike O'Shea all season, even when they were off to their 9-0 and start, spoke of the importance of taking it one game, one week at a time. Their goal was to go 1-0. and They weren't looking at... 10 and 0, 11 and 0, 12 and 0, whatever the streak was going to be with their next win. They wanted to go 1 and 0 week in and week out. So if there's a coach in this league that can keep a team focused, even though they've run away with the regular season standings, that's Coach Mike O'Shea. And I believe they've got the pieces in Winnipeg and the focus that they are going to win this game. And I will take them to cover that five point spread as well. The one point that I will bring out, remember back to the 2021 West Final. Much colder day than will be this Sunday. The Bombers started with six turnovers. I don't think you can do that against the Lions and win. No, that's ball protection will be key in this one as well. And and hopefully for the Bombers, that's something that Zach Kolaris has taken to heart. It was very unusual to see that many turnovers from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And I, I don't anticipate seeing that again. But there's a reason you play the games. We've talked all season when we were making these game predictions that a a team that you thought had no business winning came out on top. And on any given Sunday, anything can happen. All things being equal, it will be a sky of blue come Grey Cup Sunday. Thank you for listening to our show. Third Down Gamble is hosted on Podbean and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter at Third Down Gamble. Join us again, the Third Down Gamble podcast, audio worth watching. Third Down Gamble uses the expert resources provided by Canadian Football League player and game statistics, for analytics, game notes, and statistics, and 3downnation.com for news, insight, and in-depth analysis. Please visit cfl.ca and 3downnation.com for the most up-to-date information on the Canadian Football League.